This is AutoLine Daily, the show dedicated to enthusiasts of the automotive industry. Well, it looks like the coronavirus is starting to impact the automotive industry in unexpected ways. Long-term car loans can lower your monthly payments, but you also end up paying more for the car in the end. But because of the economic uncertainty caused by the coronavirus, car buyers are going for longer-term loans. Prior to the virus outbreak, only 7 to 8 percent of new car buyers took out an 84-month loan, but that shot up to 23 percent in the last week of March. Some automakers like GM, FCA, and Hyundai are also enticing those buyers by offering 0 percent financing on 84-month loans. The benefit to automakers is higher margins. As I said, longer loans, lower monthly payments, and people end up buying a more expensive car. Automakers are also raising their prices in kind of a sneaky way. They're hiking the destination charges, which supposedly pay for the cost of shipping cars to dealerships. Most automakers advertise the price of their cars without including destination charges. There are some exceptions, like General Motors, but we at AutoLine will only report the price of a vehicle, including its destination charge. In fact, we're amazed that automakers are able to legally advertise the price of a car without those charges, since you can't buy a car without it. Consumer Reports has been tracking the price of those charges and says they've gone up 30% since 2011, which is far above the rate of inflation. Fiat Chrysler has the highest charges, almost $1,600 on average, Ford and GM charge almost $1,300, while Toyota charges about $1,100 and Honda almost $1,000. Remember that Cash for Clunker program that ran during the Obama administration during the Great Recession? Well, maybe we're going to see something like that again. Back then, Congress authorized $3 billion for incentives to trade in an old inefficient car and buy a new one and that triggered $13 billion in sales. So far, there's no talk in Congress for another Cash for Clunker program in which consumers could get up to $4,500 to buy a new car. But Ford's Mark Lenave raised the issue during an interview with Bloomberg, and U.S. Representative Debbie Dingell says it is being discussed in Congress, but they haven't reached any consensus yet. And you know, the best Cash for Clunker story I heard came from a Ford dealer. If you remember, not only did you have to trade in an old clunker, the dealer had to destroy the engine so it would not go back on the road again. So dealers would pour a chemical into the radiator that would cause the engine to seize up. It was like pouring Drano into the radiator. One thing is, the V8s and those old Ford F-150s just would not die. As the Ford dealer told me, most engines would seize up in a matter of minutes, But we'd come back two hours later and that V8 would still be chugging and smoking and wheezing, but it wouldn't die. The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We invite you to join us for AutoLine After Hours this Thursday when our guest is going to be Doug DeMuro, one of YouTube's superstar car reviewers. Doug built up an audience of millions with his reviews, and we'll get the background on how he did it. Frank Marcus from Motor Trend will also be on the show. So join Gary and me for one of the best gearhead programs in the business. Even though we reported dismal sales in March, one brand actually bucked the trend. LMC Automotive reports that Bentley saw its sales shoot up 34%. It only sold 219 vehicles, so it didn't take much to boost the percentage jump. Nonetheless, it's the best sales news we've come across. LMC says that Ram and Kia were the only other brands that did not fall by more than 20% last month. The supplier Kama, which is part of FCA, is now using laser welding to make batteries and motors for electric vehicles. Laser welding is extremely precise, and the new system allows it to automatically alternate between fiber and diode lasers. And it can also handle working with different melting temperatures of metals, such as copper and aluminum, while still ensuring a precise joint. This technology allows it to experiment with new techniques to save on time and cost. 
Kamo is using the system at a couple of plants in Italy, as well as one in Shanghai and another in Detroit. The SAE is looking for engineers, researchers, and entrepreneurs. It's all part of its Create the Future Design Contest. It's a global forum to share ideas for new products and technologies that could generate jobs, improve health and safety, protect the environment, and benefit society in other ways. You'll need to provide at least one picture of your entry, a description with how it works and what makes it novel, how it would be produced, and pick one of seven categories it will be applied in. Entries will be accepted up until July 1st. There's no cost to sign up, and the top prize is $20,000. As the SAE says, your ideas are needed now more than ever. We often ask for your help in trying to identify an old car, but now Ford wants to tap into your knowledge base. Five years ago, Ford's performance division received photos from 1966 of a mid-engine Mustang prototype being assembled in the international side of the automaker's Dearborn Design Studio. Only thing is, no one at Ford seems to know anything about this car, even the top people in charge of the design studio. They've ruled out several possibilities, like this being the Mach 2 concept, so now they're turning to you. And we'd love to know what you think. And you can also send an email to clubhub at ford.com. A new Tesla feature called stopping at traffic lights was caught on video by an owner. Using the front cameras and GPS info, the car will stop at all traffic lights, even green ones. A text will pop up on the center screen saying that the car will stop and where it will stop. The driver can override the feature by hitting the gear stock or throttle. Stopping at traffic lights is meant to emphasize caution, but seems like it might be more of a learning tool for Tesla's autopilot system. Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. General Motors is making a big deal about how it's going to convert its Hamtramck plant in Detroit to making only electric SUVs and trucks. And of course, that includes one that's going to be rebadged as a Hummer. But that's not the only GM plant that will be making electric sport utes and pickups. Auto Forecast Solutions reports that GM's plant in Ramos Arispe, Mexico, will be making all electric full-size D-Class SUVs for Cadillac in April of 2023, and an all-electric C-Class Chevrolet SUV a few months later in July. GM is going to build two EVs for Honda starting in 2024, and while neither company announced where they're going to be made, we've got to add Ramos to the list of possibilities. And as I've been saying, electric cars don't need a front radiator grill. In fact, I've also predicted that EVs with grills are going to start to look very old-fashioned in another year or two. But BMW's head of design, Domagaj Ducek, tells Autoblog that its iconic twin kidney grill will not go away with its electric cars. While it will continue to evolve, Ducek says the grill is the biggest differentiator between BMW and all of its luxury rivals. You know, it's going to be interesting to see how BMW's grill will evolve. Maybe the company will take Ford's approach with the Mach-E, which has a silhouette of a grill, which is unlike Audi, which slapped what looks like a big radiator grill on the front of the e-tron. And as EVs grow in popularity, they're going to add more load to the grid. One solution to help manage those extra loads are microgrids. For those of you unfamiliar with microgrids, they're a group of interconnected energy sources that can operate independently of the main power grid. I just interviewed Andy Hahn, the CTO of Microgrid Business at a company called Schneider Electric, and he explained how microgrids can help fleet operators make the switch from ICE vehicles to electric ones. Where can, where can we really make and, and who, who can really make uh, value out of microgrids? Well, it turns out that especially the points you raised about the fleet vehicle, manu fleet vehicle owners, but also fleet vehicle manufacturers who are on to be able to sell fleet vehicles to end users who are currently using internal combustion engine uh, vehicles. These microgrids can be packaged and sized 
such that when you want to sell a set of vehicles to a to an end user, you can bring the electrical infrastructure along with the charging apparatus to be able to bring the capability to the site. So you're not just dumping a bunch of vehicles on site and telling the end user to figure out how to get them charged. The electrical system can actually deliver all of that. And the end and the provider of the system can can work with a Schneider or other packaged uh, uh, solution providers to bring this electric vehicle infrastructure and make it easy for a fleet operator or a large user of electric vehicles to be able to make that transition from ICE to electric vehicles much pain, much more painful, much less painful. And of course, you can watch that entire interview right now on our YouTube channel. Before we go, looks like Henrik Fisker is going to make an off-road version of the ocean. He tweeted this teaser of the ocean that says, Rescue Zero Emission Vehicle. He also says they found a place to hide the spare tire that could only be done with an EV. Where do you think that spot is? Here's a hint. It's not the trunk or the front. And with that, we wrap up today's show. Thank you for watching AutoLine Daily.